It's so nice to see lots of you guys. Uh, my presentation, which Tyler is bringing up, is really not about my journey into aviation, but it's more about what your journey could be. And you guys are in the difficult phase of uh, our building, experience building, and looking at TV screens uh, in, in front of... Can we turn off the light? Uh, I had a guy who came and did a conversion with me on a, on a bat walk, who flies from Lanseria and he flies regularly over Biffelsport Dam and back, and he's never ever seen Silver Creek, which is, which is two miles to the southeast of Biffelsport Dam. And the reason why, because he flies inside the cockpit. He's looking at that TV screen in front of him and wondering what's going on. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation flying, or a conservation pilot and a bush pilot. There is a difference. Everyone thinks it's the same. Um, just give me a rating on this thing. <laughs> so a little bit about my journey, not too much. I fell in love with a uh, bat hawk aircraft. It's locally built in Nelspruit, two-seater, side-by-side. Uh, the latest ones have a little 100 horsepower Rotax engine. And I've got myself to a point where I can fly them, fix them, and teach them. And I've had the, the pleasure of traveling all over. Uh, the pleasure of flying them in some really crazy, crazy places. This was going off to Inyaka Island. And this was landing uh, when my bladder uh, endurance had given up on the way back from, and I think it was near Middleburg Dam. But that's just the ability of this aircraft. Uh, this picture here, assembling an aircraft up in a game reserve for a town called Buna. The game reserve was Kamoe National Park, uh, up in the Ivory Coast. And... Um, Anyway, a little bit more about the, the battle locally produced in Nelspruit. Um, I've got uh, in an engineering shop, so I make a lot of the parts for it. And I've just fallen in love with it. And it's sent me on travels to, sorry, to, uh, this was Dakar, a little town called Sally, which is just south of Dakar in Senegal. And I assembled an aircraft there and had to test fly it over the beach for hours and hours and hours. But I managed to get the test flying done. Uh, the next one was in Cote d'Ivoire. That's where Cote d'Ivoire sits on the, on the west coast. It's a two-day trip to drive up to this game reserve called Kamoe National Park. And the conservation problems they have in there is uh, they've been involved in a civil war for 18 years. So it's a, it's a, they call it a red district. They've got the neighbors from Burkina Faso coming through into Kamoe uh, to pan for gold. And of course, they're shooting all the animals and eating them. And, and they've been sponsored an aircraft. And now we're trying to train pilots to understand um, the conservation side of it. But they've gone one step further. They've got, they've fitted cameras onto the, onto the aircraft, two cameras at a 10 degree angle. And they are now flying um, a grid pattern over Kamoe, taking photographs every four seconds, feeding the images into, into AI, and it's giving them an annual count that's accurate up to about 94%, uh, which, is, uh, which is helping tremendously, and they're watching a very rare um, um, forest elephant, which they've found recently, about three weeks ago, and now they're monitoring their numbers. Anyway, uh, this is Virunga up in the DRC. Uh, they run about eight bat hawks there. One of them configured with a stretcher on the side of it to move uh, injured rangers out of the park and also to transport food and supplies to the rangers in the park. And that's, I'll show you later on, that's a, a war zone. Uh, Tanzania, there's bat hawks flying up there. Malawi. South, uh, South DRC, there's a bat hawks out there. Uh, northern Mozambique, uh, it was one of them that the guy actually stalled it, thought he 
saw some, uh, he actually thought he saw a carcass of something and he got it all wrong and he stalled and fell into a bush and walked out of it. So he was <laughs> quite lucky. Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, the, this is Zambia here, they fly them over uh, the Toka sky over the Vic Falls and I've had the pleasure of flying over there in an open cockpit which is which is just so lekker. You're not cocooned in this little metal tube sweeping away. Uh, this here was Tanzania, that was a, which is up there and it's a, it's called Sulu National Park. I think it's 53,000 hectares. It's about three times the size of Kruger Park. And I, when I was flying over there, it, it was an absolute from horizon to horizon, a sea of trees, just forest. And I suddenly found myself flying higher and higher and higher because I thought if I go down there, it's going to make a little hole in the trees and then anything below that's going to eat me. But there's absolutely no place to get any aircraft in there. There's no ways that you're going to walk out of that. And uh, so I started, I found a riverbed and I started flying that. And I said I'd rather deal with the buffaloes and the, and the hippos and stuff than, uh, than flying over the forest. Anyway, what is the difference between a bush pilot and a conservation pilot? And George knows, you, you've been there. Bush flying involves operations in terrain where you're often landing on dirt and grass runways, requires the following skills, safe loading of passengers. And when I say safe loading, I mean it's you, you're the load master. You've got to put the baggage and luggage into the aircraft and balance it. Um, you've got to fly small aircraft occasionally into remote areas, able to survive away, away from base for a few weeks at a time, generally taking your washing with you for two or three weeks. Uh, that could be quite difficult. It's more a, a trade for a young single person, I think. Uh, you generally fly lodge to lodge, and there's one or two that are moving medical supplies around. But generally it's predetermined routes, predetermined heights, and that's why I couldn't ever be an airline pilot, because I don't want to be told when to fly, where to fly, how high to fly, and when to... It's just... Yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's why I stuck to this spell. Um, what is a conservation pilot? So conduct aerial patrols and surveys within protected areas to aid in conservation. The following skills. Now this, I train all the young pilots that go and fly at Pilonsburg. And if they don't have a passion and knowledge of animals and birds and they just want an hour build, then go away. Don't just come and use it as an hour building thing. If you, if you don't know the difference between a hardy dog and a mossy, goodbye. You, you're not involved. Um, good flying skills, which, which I found and none of them really have, because when you're doing your PPR, you're taught to learn or to land on those long black things. What do they call them again? <laughs> runways. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, landing on a runway is the easy part. Landing on a runway where you need to put your wheels down on a particular mark, because if you're longer than that, you're not going to stop on the, on the dirt strip. That's the, uh, one of the, the things that I focus on. Understanding weather and wind and seasons, because you might be stationed out in the bush, there's no way that you're going to get cell phone signal. So you need to know and understand weather patterns for that area. Refueling your aircraft. Don't just chuck fuel in, you're going to filter it. You're going to make sure you, you strain it before you take off. And service and maintain and troubleshoot. So when a guy phones me up and says, I'm stuck in the bush uh, at La Palala and the battle won't start. So, okay, what's it do? So, well, it won't start. So, okay. Is, does the propeller go round and round? Uh, yes, it goes round and round. Okay. Are the mags on? Uh, let me go try again. And he comes back, no, it still won't start. Okay. Is the choke on? Yes. Have you got fuel in the aircraft? Yes, I have. Have you checked the fuel? Yes. Okay. Give me a bit more feedback. Let's take one of the float poles off. What's that? Now that's when the trouble starts. Now I've got to fly all the way up to La Balala and find out he's got some other minor problem. A wasp has built a nest inside the vent, the little uh, breather on the carburetor, and the, the uh, bowl will not fill up, and the engine will not start. And that's a five-minute fix. So 
I've got to teach them basic um, maintenance, basic knowledge, basic troubleshooting. Give me some more feedback so that I don't fly all the way there and give them a bill for no reason. This guy, sorry, just go back to this. This guy here is, is uh, Commandant Kissy. He's uh, in the parks and military up in, uh, in the Ivory Coast. Right, let's just go to Pilonsburg. Um, this particular day here, I was flying over Pilonsburg and uh, I thought I spotted a dung beetle in distress, so I landed next to the lake. It was in COVID and uh, it was just so nice to sit and listen to the hippos munching away. It was down there. Anyway, this give you, gives you an idea of Pilonsburg Strip. It's only 250 meters long. There's a bump in the ground here, so you've got to touch down just there where that spot is and stop the aircraft. There's no go around, uh, and if there is, you've got to make that call at about 100 foot. You can't do it lower than that. And part of the training is I, I put the guy in the aircraft, we'll, we'll simulate at 100 foot, I'll say go around, there's good on the runway, and he'll put take power and he'll turn left into high ground. Because it's natural, because your pilot sits on the left, so let's just turn left so I can see where I'm going. So it's just those basic skills that you've got to teach the guy. Stick forward and turn right, and if you fly with the house roofs, it doesn't matter. You fly to keep yourself safe. And it just gives you an idea of, of Lonsberg's uh, length of strip. And incidentally, talking of training and hours and stuff that, that you guys have spoken about, there was a, the first pilot that Pilonsberg ever had. The guy's name was Gavin Stewart. And he flew, and he accumulated about 600 hours flying a battle around the park. And then he went up to Namibia to get a job and applied for a, a job at some, some other company. And he was up against a pilot who had 1,500 hours. And they gave him the job over the 1,500 hour pilot because of his bush flying experience. So don't believe that uh, even, even though you fly in a battle, it does have an ILS. Well, ILS is I land slowly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the IFR, that's got, which is I fly around. It's just around the park. Anyway, I just want to play this little video. If you could play this video, this just gives you an insight into, into this amazing therapy. The early daybreak, with the sun rising, signals the end of the lion's reign over the night as it retires to rest. Meanwhile, the Bat Hawk aircraft prepares to take flight, symbolizing the changing of the guard as daytime creatures awaken. Being a conservation pilot is a big responsibility not only to keep the wildlife safe, but also to ensure the safety of those flying with you. Anton van Lagerenberg flies for the Okimalanga Tourism Parks Agency, tasked with safeguarding the precious inhabitants of this untamed wilderness. His mission to protect the rhinos, the gentle giants on the brink of extinction. It's a privilege to be able to do this. Flying and nature are my passions, and I'm lucky to combine both. The bat hawk, the eye in the sky. From its aerial perch, it surveys the land with a watchful gaze, missing nothing, observing all. Air surveillance plays a crucial role in counter-poaching efforts. From the vantage point of the sky, aircraft have a unique ability to cover large areas of terrain efficiently and to monitor remote regions that may be difficult to access by ground patrols alone. With precision and determination, it seeks out the elusive rhinos, those majestic giants threatened by poachers. Its keen eye pierces through the camouflage of the landscape, guiding the efforts of those on the ground. Furthermore, air surveillance can provide real-time intelligence to ground teams, allowing them to respond swiftly to poaching incidents or other threats to wildlife. By coordinating with ground patrols, aircraft can help guide law enforcement efforts and ensure a rapid and effective response. Albatross Africa Foundation, recognizing the critical need for daily patrols to protect wildlife and maintain security, proudly sponsors the airway. 
However, the foundation faces challenges in covering all operational costs, prompting the call for additional support from donors and supporters. Thank you for your support. Together we can make a difference. Thank you for watching. Be our wingman and see you on the next flight. So this is the, the sad reality of conservation flying. And in 2015, 2016, we lost about uh, just over a thousand rhino in one year. The numbers are, are increasing now. And from, well, last year alone, we've lost 325 rhino in KwaZulu Natal. And there's a, there's a real need for conservation pilots. Now, I wished I could travel to every single game farm in the country and, and say to them, like a farmer, if you don't have a tractor, you can't farm. If you don't have an aircraft, you shouldn't be only an exotic game like that, because you can't protect them. And I don't think you've been to, you've met Stan, haven't you? I mean, you want to. So he's, he's brought his own battle and he flies his own patrol every morning and every night and it's just an eye in the sky. You're not going to find a poacher on your farm. But they just know that there's an aircraft up there. The aircraft, they believe, is like an eagle. You can see everything. Um, but certainly, you know, flying, uh, if you've spotted a carcass, 10 to 1, you must look for a little, a little um, calf that might be in the area. So at least you can get, get and save that. But... He, he's got the right idea. He, he puts his own tools and equipment in to manage his own uh, bunch of rhino. So now this is the DRC that I spoke to you about, and the, the reality of... They, they're fighting a war. Silverback gorillas, they'll, they'll eliminate a whole family just to sell a baby to some, some Chinaman for $10,000. And uh, Anthony is, uh, I did his rating on a bat hawk, and he's probably got the most hours in the world on a, on a bat hawk by now. There you see him sitting there with two chimpanzees flying a, I think he was in a 182 or something. And Anthony fights this war on a daily basis. He, uh, it's, it's uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and deforestation of the three things that he's up against. And the militia are just increasing in numbers. He's lost over 200 rangers in the last uh, yeah. couple of years. So that's not somewhere I want to go and work, but the salary is good. <laughs> and anyway, just some of the privileged views. You know, you fly in an open cockpit early in the morning, shorts and t-shirt, and you fly in the 200 feet and you can, you get to see, I've spotted leopard, I've spotted wild dog, I've spotted uh, five cheetah in the Pilonsberg, and obviously the majestic rhino and so on, it's just a, an absolute privilege. The other we use down at the coast uh, for conservation, these pictures for me tell a, a beautiful story. I flew up to Berlin in a bat hawk and had a whale breach next to me. And it's, you, you've got the image in your mind, you can't share that with anybody. You've just got to take it and, and uh, enjoy that. And obviously bat talk proudly South African. And I'm this, these words here were for, for Derek. Because everything, everything he wants to do is fast. But if you want an hour build, fly slowly. <laughs> That's it. Any questions? So I just wanted to ask, uh, when bush fly, uh, are there any regulations as to where you can land or any public uh, land is available for you so to land it? Within the reserve, they'll have demarcated areas where they've cleared it out and made it safe for you to land. That'll be, that'll be part of the reserve's... Um, program in conservation. Like in, uh, in, up in Kamoe National Park, they've got two strips that they've put 
into the into the game reserve. They've only got one aircraft, so they've got the logistics of getting fuel there, getting supplies there, and then flying a route where they can patrol a third each day. Do you want to understand the, the route that you're going to take to go from start your uh, PPL to rear, CPL, those topics? But this aircraft doesn't fly PPL. So what is the route that you're going to take and what is the license that you require? No, I mean, if you've, if you've done your PPL, the guys are using this to our build. It's an LSA, it, it's, uh, it's, it falls just under 600 kilograms, but your hours count right up to your CPL. So you basically, so if, you, if you're starting out now, and you start on that, then obviously you'll be able to convert to PPL later. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at is, as a foreign career, you're starting with zero, meaning you start to uh, LSA license, from an LSA license, how do you get to come to physical? Do you need to do a commercial license? CAA have changed all of that, and that's, um, which is sad. So you, you would do an NPL license in the, on this aircraft, uh, do your 35 hours, then we would convert you onto a, onto a 17 skew or one of those things, and you'll go and do 15 hours in that, then you'll have your PPL, and then you can choose your route into aviation. But CAA have now changed all of that, saying, and we learn out of the same books, same, same subject, same everything. They say, no, you must write NPL subjects, and then you must go and write PPL subjects, and go and you know, write, do both, uh, both flight tests, which doesn't make sense to me. But the hours count. So do you need a, hours count, yeah. Do you need a commercial license to be able to come and do uh, flying like you just showed us how? No, most of these guys at Pilonsburg are studying to, to, for their comm licenses, but they're building hours and they get paid a stipend. So you know, just, how much do you pay then during this time of flying on the NPL? They're only paid a stipend, which is basically goes towards their food. Fuel and everything sponsored. Not a salary. Not a salary. Not a salary. Not a, not a, not a, that's right. Okay. So you still ultimately need to have a commercial license? If you want to get a salary out of it, yes. Except up in Africa. And then, as far as um, doing a, uh, 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 rating, how would you become an instructor on this? You still need to do commercial and then instructor? No, no. So it's 200 hours on top, and then you will do 15 hours uh, better, right seat. And then you'll do 15 hours classroom, and you can get your NPL instructor's rating. There's a, a whole bunch of exams to write as well. But it's not as stringent as a PPL um, instructor's rating. Sean, Sean, anyone wanting to do a conversion on one of these things can come see you and talk about it? Yeah, they can. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have an introductory flight, we can arrange a day up at, which is something that I still want to talk to Tyler about. We get some groups of students up to Silver Creek. We take you flying. I'll put you in the left seat, let you fly it. And you'll see it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. Really.